Okay, questions. I have one question. Yes, I sir. I want to ask you a controversial question. How do you, uh, as a brother? He will answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I want to have this conversation because sure. uh, there is a misunderstanding <clears throat> about Islam and Muslims all over the world. So just please answer this. How do, are you associated with ISIS, Taliban? How do you address that? Okay. Jihad? Okay, so the question but, is... Uh, yeah, because this is, <clears throat> this is kind of narrative about... Because now today I see that Islamophobia is ruling the world, even in India and all. So these uh, hard questions need to be... Uh, sure, sure. Surely answered. So I would love as a brother... Of course, uh, of course. I want you to ask you these tough questions. How do you address ISIS, the way Taliban operates Islam? How do they interpret Quran and, you know, the hijab thing? All right, so we'll be staying here for the whole day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking. No, ask, ask the questions. <laughs> it was a 1 p.m. lecture, and I arrived at IIT at 1.09 p.m. I was not happy at all because I was late. You know, I'm not supposed to be late. So when I arrived, uh, I came to the front quickly. I grabbed the mic, and I mentioned to them, I'm really sorry that I'm late over here. The reason I'm late is uh, because I was doing jihad, right? <laughs> so I told them, you know, so they were thinking, Sabil, where is your sword, man? Where is your gun? I said, fighting the Chicago traffic was my jihad, <laughs> all right? <laughs> take you away from uh, other also but if you have any any question about you know well, feel free no problem. No problem. it was really good okay. that gave all of you like a good uh, overview of what happens in the mosque right? the activities the dynamic ways that we are helping out not just the Muslim community is part of Islam to help and cater to the bigger community because one of the commandments in uh, the Quran, in chapter 3, verse number 104, is that Muslims are supposed to be enjoining good and forbidding evil, not just from the Muslim community, but for all, from all of humanity. If we see something wrong going on in the society, we should work with the good-hearted people, the police and other people, to eradicate that uh, you know, evil in the society. If we are seeing something good happening, we should be joining the forces, and we should be multiplying that goodness. So a Muslim is not supposed to just sit in the mosque and pray five times and you know, be in the home and taking care of children. That's part of Islam also. But we are supposed to be ambassadors of peace, indulging in the society and bettering the society. And that is the reason we have so many dynamic activities over here. For the young and the old, people of different races coming here. We have the food pantry, the blood drives and the clothing drives. Uh, we have, uh, you know, clinic and the attorney services, many mosques around the U.S., we have that. So we just came back from, uh, the, from the prayer, right? Uh, so a long time ago, actually. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> time flies. An important aspect of the prayer is that uh, after we wash ourselves, when we clean ourselves and we stand facing the Kaaba, then we pray. One of the important ways that we pray, one of the actions is that we prostrate and then we pray to the Creator, right? We have certain recitations, certain way that we thank and we uh, praise the Creator. When we look into the history, we can find out that almost all the prophets of God, or all the prophets of God, they used to pray exactly the way that we Muslims are praying. For example, if you look into Genesis uh, chapter 17, verse number 3, when he was joyous with some good news, the very first thing that he did was he prayed and he bowed down himself and he prayed to one God. So that's so important. Bowed down means he prostrated himself. So we say we are also following Abraham. You know, when it comes to Moses and his uh, people, they used to go and wash themselves and then before they approached the place for prayer, they used to go there after cleaning themselves and then they used to prostrate. In the book of Numbers, it's mentioned that. And when it comes to Jesus, who we take as a mighty prophet, the way that we pray, Jesus prayed exactly the same way when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, people were coming after him, so he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
he prostrated himself and he said, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39. So we say that, yes, we are following uh, the rituals, the actions, and the message of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the prophets. So I thought that was a good footnote to one of the actions that we do in our prayers. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there other expressions of your faith during your worship? Like, I know there wasn't any music um, or, or dance or anything like that. Are there other, other ways that you express your faith um, in addition to prayer and living a life holy unto God. I was just curious. Sure, sure. So, so the question is really important. What other ways that you, that you appreciate God and follow God's guidance? So besides the five pillars of Islam, which I assume all of you know, right? Yes. So what are the five pillars? Quickly, then I will go to that question, inshallah. Okay, so let's start from not you. You know it. And you know it. No, no. And you know it. <laughs> Come on. Uh, let's start. It always comes to you, right? No, let's start from the left side here. <laughs> okay, tell me one pillar of Islam. Okay, who remembers honestly? Yes, pilgrimage is one. Going to uh, where? Where do we go? France, London, Paris? No. Uh, it's to Medina. It's Mecca. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. I was second guessing myself. I was like, this is a half Yes, once in a lifetime, if the means allows it, then a person goes and do the rituals to fulfill one pillar of Islam, which is Hajj, going to Mecca. Mm -hmm. What would be one more pillar? Um, there's one God. Okay. Yes, the testimony of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. So that's the testimony of faith that we recite many times a day in the prayer. And that's the way a person converts to Islam. Once he says, you know what, I have studied Islam, I want to now become a Muslim of my own choice, how do I do that? So we don't have like a pool in the basement for baptism, <laughs> we don't. Yeah. We explain to them the six beliefs, the five pillars. Once the person understands it, then he recites the Shahada, the testimony of faith. In English it goes like this, that I bear witness that there is no other God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad Peace be upon him is his messenger. So that's the second pillar. What do you think one more pillar of Islam? A hint, hint. You just saw it in there, other place. There you go, right? That's a big hint, come on. <laughs> so we pray five times a day, right? But when it comes to prayer, these are the five times of worship or five periods of worship. So besides these five periods of worship, there are other prayers that we can do. That means I can pray right now in English language that, oh God, bring justice and peace and morality and, uh, and uh, remove the oppression from, of the oppressors in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Syria, in Lebanon, all over the world. Oh Allah, give good health to my parents. Oh Allah, make my children good children, good moral children. So I can pray any language anywhere besides the five daily prayers. All right, okay. Three, two more to go. Fasting. Oh, Fasting in the month of Ramadan, yes. Coming up uh, 2nd of April, approximately. For the one whole month, we are supposed to fast from dawn to sunset. And again, one of the footnotes about fasting is that we are fasting, uh, so it says in the Quran, chapter 2, verse number 183, that, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. So you can attain God consciousness, closeness to God, and discipline in God. So the important aspect is we are fasting because God gave that as an obligation. Because people before us, the followers and the other prophets, they were also given that injunction of fasting. So when we are fasting, we are actually following the sunnah or the example of Moses, Jesus, Abraham, and all the prophets and messengers. Two quick examples, Brother Ubaid. One of them would be, when Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, when he received uh, the Ten Commandments, it says in the book of Exodus, he was in the state of fasting. So we are fasting because he was fasting also. When, it's, when it comes to Jesus, it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 2, Jesus was in the state of fasting 40 days and 40 nights. So we are also following his example. And obviously, fast fasting brings us close to God, discipline. When we are fasting the whole day, like 14 hours, 
Then when we break the fast with the date fruit, now we realize the blessings of God that we just take for granted. We can also place ourselves in the shoes of the person who may be hungry, there are billions of people hungry in the world. We can say that, you know what, let's help them, but we are feeling what they're feeling. It will help us to reach out to them better. One more pillar to go. Yes, which is called the zakat. Good, very good, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> good, good. So, you know, there was a survey that came out two months ago, right, Sister Amina? Two months ago, a survey came out that says that Muslims are the most charitable people in the USA. Means when it comes to the percentage of assets and the wealth that give out, Muslims are number one in that, Professor Ubaid, right? So at least 2.5% of our saved assets, we calculate for the whole year, then we give a charity or we call it the zakat. So that's an obligation. But besides the 2.5%, a person can give any amount besides that to the orphanage, to the orphans, to the widows, building of the hospitals, building of the wells, homeless in Chicago, right? Any place, anywhere, we are supposed to be helping and taking care of humanity. So those are the five pillars, but quickly your question is that besides the rituals of praying and all of that, what other ways that you please the creator? So there are some other important obligations. A Muslim is supposed to be a force of goodness in the society, and joining good and forbidding evil. We are supposed to be activists because Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the prophets, they were activists in the society. Secondly, we are supposed to peacefully share the message of Islam with other people. That's also an obligation because we say that every prophet of God from Adam all the way to Muhammad, peace be upon him, they preached and they invited people only to submit to one God. We cannot force anyone. There is no force in Islam. We have to give them the chance, educate them, and then invite them. If they accept, fine. If they don't, it's between them and the creator. Then we are supposed to gain education. You know, by gaining education, we realize the wonders that God has, Allah has created all around us and within us. So education is an obligation that God has given to every single male and every single female from cradle to the grave. So there is no such thing, such thing in Islam that once you're sophomore, once you're done with high school, that you can drop out, no. A Muslim is constantly supposed to keep on gaining education, good education, beneficial education, and benefiting the society. Besides that, we have certain obligations as Muslims towards our parents. You know, it says in the Quran, chapter 17, verse number 21, how we are supposed to take care of the parents, especially when they're of old age. We're not supposed to even, you know, say anything wrong to them, but show humility and obedience and taking care of them. Uh, there is one important hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let me recite that over here. A person came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asked him a really important question. Of all the people in the whole world, who should be my love, my, admi my admiration, my taking care of, should go towards? And the Prophet said, your mother. And then the person asked the question again, okay, fine, after the mother, then who next? And then the Prophet said, your mother. And then he asked the question, okay, fine, mother, and then the mother, then who next? And then the Prophet said, your mother, right? Mm -hmm. And the fourth time he asked the question, then the Prophet said, your father. Mm -hmm. So dads like us, if you were playing like the spiritual Olympics, right? They win, the mothers win, you know, with all the honor God has given, the gold medal, the silver medal, and the bronze medal, and we just come back with a participation prize, <laughs> right? <laughs> Parents, both parents, by the way, father and mother. So there is no concept of nursing home in Islam. The nursing home of the parents is the home of the children. So we don't, we are not supposed to place them in old people's home and send, you know, flowers on the Mother's Day and Father's Day. No, they are supposed to be living with us. We are supposed to be living, taking care of them where they they have taken care of us, right? So that's also one of the ways we are worshiping the Creator when we are taking care of the parents. Then Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, you're not a full believer if you eat your full and your neighbors are hungry. That means we are supposed to be taking care of the neighbors. I mean, neighbors means all of humanity in one way. Making sure that, you know, they have enough to eat, enough to, uh, you know, any need that they have, we are supposed to take care of them. If we are not, that means we are not a full believer. So that's also one of the ways that we are helping uh, humanity by following God's guidance. 
Then there are certain obligations that we have uh, towards our immediate family, our children, our spouses. We have to give them good names, good education, make them good humans, good Muslims, uh, good Americans, right? Be good citizens of any country that we live in. We have certain obligations towards what we eat and what we should not be eating. So there is zero percent tolerance of any intoxicants in Islam. Just means we cannot take any intoxicants. So no alcohol, no wine, no drugs, because Islam is a zero you know, tolerance for any intoxicants. And we know the reason, right? how it corrupts the mind, how it causes so many diseases, how they are causing 45,000 car crashes and car, you know, deaths by drunk driving each single year, 40,000 suicides and many spousal abuses and rapes and assaults and homicides because of drugs are involved in there. Then we have certain obligations. Uh, so we cannot eat pork, we cannot have any intoxicants, uh, you know, no smoking too, by the way. So Islam is a faith which is supposed to be clean living, healthy living. And lastly, we have certain obligations towards uh, animals, towards the environment. Quran speaks about how we should take care of the resources all around us. So a Muslim and Islam, when we practice the faith, it is supposed to transform the society for better. It should transform ourselves. It should transform the, uh, our immediate family. And with that, we are supposed to transform the society and connect ourselves and the society to the worship of one God. Okay, questions. I have one question. Yes, I sir. I want to ask you a controversial question. How do you, uh, as a brother? He will answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I want to have this conversation because sure. uh, there is a misunderstanding about Islam and Muslims all over the world. So just please answer this. How do you, are you associated with ISIS, Taliban? How do you address that? Okay. Jihad? Okay, so the question is... Uh, yeah, because this is, <coughs> this is kind of narrative about... Because now today I see that Islamophobia is ruling the world, even in India and all. So these uh, hard questions need to be... Uh, sure, sure. Surely answered. So I would love as a brother... Of course, uh, of course. I want to, to ask you this tough question. How do you address ISIS, the way Taliban operates Islam? How do they interpret Quran? And, you know, the hijab thing... All right, so we'll be staying here for the whole day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking. No, ask, ask the questions. There you go. <laughs> Where's my heart seat over here? <laughs> okay, so fine. Yes, yes. Jokes aside, all right, this is a serious topic, but I'm really glad first and foremost, you know, we should be, we should be asking questions, even controversial questions, even no. questions of differences, because you know, what's the point? You know, we are here, we have a lot of things in common, but there are differences. Yes, we can discuss the differences, why not? So one of the perceptions people may have is about terrorism mm -hmm. and jihad and ISIS and all of these. So first and foremost, what I can say is that we should not judge any faith by the actions of some misguided people. Do all of you agree with that? And I say to my Muslim friends, to the Muslims, that we should not judge Christianity by the actions of the KKK. Do you also agree with that? So there has to be a demarcation between the pure, perfect, and the beautiful teachings of Islam from the misguided Muslims on the ground because they are good and bad apples and the followers of any faith. You know, I was in Dallas for a presentation, exactly similar question came. And I mentioned to them that we Muslims, we don't want to judge Christianity by the actions of KKK and the Crusaders and the Spanish Inquisition and Andre Brovik in the name of Christianity, he slaughtered 78 people in Norway or by the, or by the genocide of the Native Americans over here or by the slave traders. We don't want to judge Christianity based upon those actions mm -hmm. and we don't want to judge uh, Hinduism. By the, by the actions that the RSS and the BJP atrocities that they're doing up there. We don't want to judge uh, Judaism by the actions of what some Jewish people are doing to the Palestinians, stealing the land and pressing. We don't want to judge Buddhism by what some Buddhists are doing in Myanmar, right? They're oppressing, they're doing genocide. If we want to learn what a faith is, 
we should go to the people of knowledge of the faith, pick up the scripture. That's how we can find out what the faith teaches. So that's first and foremost important thing, right? You agree with that? <laughs> so when it comes to when it comes to jihad, right? Yeah. Jihad is a question. So the perception is that jihad is terrorism, jihad is uh, oppressing women, jihad is forcefully converting people. So first and foremost, uh, jihad just the Arabic word. It means uh, and you're making the best effort to please God. So I was invited to IIT like two or, before COVID. It was a 1 p.m. lecture and I arrived at IIT at 1.09 p.m. I was not happy at all because I was late, you know, I'm not supposed to be late. So when I arrived, uh, I came to the front quickly, I grabbed the mic and I mentioned to them, I'm really sorry that I'm late over here. The reason I'm late is uh, because I was doing jihad, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I told them, you know, so they were thinking, Sabil, where is your sword, man? Where is your gun? I said, fighting the Chicago traffic was my jihad, <laughs> all right? <laughs> they understood, they understood. So if I want to make myself better, suppose I never smoke, by the way, if I were a smoker and if I want to give up smoking, so I have to take certain steps. So if my brother, if brother Akhtar Sadiq, if he sees me, that I'm struggling, right, to give up smoking, he would say, you know, uh, Dr. Sabil, uh, may God help you succeed in your jihad to give up smoking. Mm -hmm. So that's one example of jihad. Me taking care of the parents, sister Amina wearing the hijab, going out in public, despite some people verbally attacking and physically attacking, but holding to the principle, she is doing jihad. So jihad in a personal way, to make ourselves better, to please the God. Jihad in a collective way, the masjid is doing jihad when we are having blood drives, when we have clothing drives, uh, when we are taking care of the bigger community by our resources and time and sacrifices, we are doing jihad. The third example of jihad is the armed jihad, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where the controversy comes in, the red flags are raised. But however, this is also easy to explain. It says in chapter two of the Quran, verse number 190. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse number 190, God is saying, the translation is this, that fight in the cause of God for those who fight against you, but do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. So this passage is saying that if somebody is imposing war on you, then you have the God-given right to take up arms and defend yourselves. But in that defense, do not go to extreme, do not kill their innocent people. So even in that last resort defensive war, there are certain guidelines we are supposed to follow. Mm. One of the guidelines is that you're not supposed to kill the non-combatants, women and children. There is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima Nagasaki in Islam. Even if the, uh, the enemy harms and kills your innocent civilians, even then you're not supposed to touch, harm or kill their innocent civilians. That's how careful we are supposed to be. We cannot destroy any places of worship, people who are worshiping, uh, you know, innocent people, civilians, animals, the resources. And it says in the Quran, chapter 8, verse number 61, if the enemy is ready to lay down their weapons and sign the peace treaty, we are also supposed to do that and not shoot them in the back. So these are some of the ways. So in case, in case, right, if Fox News is showing you otherwise, all right? If they are saying that, you know, these Muslims are doing jihad up there, look, they are oppressing the minorities and suppressing the women and killing some people. Uh, we say, the knowledgeable people, we say that, you know what, that is the actions of the misguided people. We should condemn them. And these are the beautiful teachings of Islam. Wow. Yes. So jihad is not terrorism. Jihad came to fight terrorism. Jihad is the opposite of terrorism. So jihad is a noble uh, you know, endeavor. If humanity does it, we are going to suppress the evil and uh, multiply the goodness so there can be justice and morality and unity away from racism, away from Islamophobia, away from anti-Semitism. And the outcome would be nothing less than peace. And that is jihad, Professor Obeid. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Controversial? No, no. <laughs> no, because recently, no, no, make it. <laughs> recently, like, uh, yes, yes. day before yesterday, a uh, mosque in Peshawar was bombed by ISIS, a Muslim mosque. Mm -hmm. by Muslims. <laughs> so, 
that's why I, I came up with that idea because Muslims killing Muslims, so like that is not jihad. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that is this yeah. is something else. <laughs> you know, when it comes to suicide bombing, suicide is forbidden and killing of the innocent is forbidden. No matter what the intention of the person, if he's doing like two wrongs, mm. obviously there would be, you know, very uh, consequences for the person on the day of judgment. So, you know, unfortunately, some Muslims may be killing some Muslims, but that's not unique to Islam or Muslims, by the way. Mm -hmm. When we know India, I have been there, you have been there, right? There's a caste system there and people, how they oppressed each other, and these are Hindus, yeah. right? And uh, so, some Christians, you know, in the 1400s or so, there used to be a hundred year war between England and France and the Europeans. Mm -hmm. That does not define Christianity. These are the shortcomings of the Christians. If some Sunnis and Shias are doing something, obviously we condemn them because it is oil and money and power and historical vengeance. So humans, they fight. Humans have emotions. Many a times they go against the teachings of the faith. So we should not judge that faith or Islam by the shortcomings of the Muslims or of any people of any other faith. Wow. This is not yes, brother. I wanted to ask you, but just piggybacking on him. So when you use the word misguided people would you would you put the misguided actions would you put that in the category of what islam refers to as jahiliya okay jahiliya means ignorance like before islam came to arabia people were in the state of jahiliya of ignorance they used to oppress women they used to take them as property they used to have inter uh, female infanticide and all of these, you know, heinous crimes because of lack of education and, and idol worship on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I will not say this is lack of ignorance. I can say this is lack of education because they do have some education. The way that some people, they may do the, the misinterpretation of the Quran. That is the reason for it, right? And Christians have done it all throughout centuries. It's not unique to Islam. Some people have taken uh, things out of context from the Old Testament, maybe from the New Testament, and they have done atrocities. Because at the end of the day, the teachings of Islam, and I'm sure it's the same with, the, with your faith, is that every single life is precious. Every single blood is precious. Every single soul is equal to each other. So for that reason, Quran says in chapter 5, verse number 32, that saving one life is like saving the life of all of humanity. And taking one life is like taking the life of all of humanity. And the Quran does not say a Muslim life. It's every single life is precious. If we take that to heart, that means that has to be reflected in our actions. That has to be reflected in the foreign policy. That means the life of a Jew is equal to a life of a Palestinian. The life of a Buddhist is equal to a life of a Muslim person in Burma. Life of a Muslim in India is equal to the life of a Hindu in India. So we have to live it, we have to put pressure, and we have to make sure that we actually practice it in a global way. That's how we can bring the peace and the justice by God's guidance. Wow. Now, here's the question I want to ask. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> can we talk a little bit about who built the Kaaba? And you're so good at recognizing the verses. Is there any biblical connection to who Muslims say built the Kaaba. Okay, so the question is who built the Kaaba and what may be some of the biblical references regarding it. So according to the Quranic sources and the sources from the Hadiths of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, Abraham, peace be upon him, and his eldest son, what was his name? Eldest Ishmael, Ishmael right? Ishmael. So both of them, they laid the foundation for the Kaaba. And they were doing dua, they were supplicating to Allah to make it as a house of peace, people surrounding, you know, protect them. So they are the initial people. Some scholars, they say that the initial foundation was laid by the very first man, Adam. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any like authentic references to it. But the authentic references are there regarding Abraham and his son Ishmael. And they also initiated certain rituals. And those rituals are continuously coming from that time to our time, like 5,000 years ago, you know, before the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Kaaba is a cubicle structure, uh, and that precinct is the very first house to worship the one creator, way before any other place in the history of humanity. 
So there are some biblical references uh, that speaks about, uh, so Abraham, when he took his son and his wife Hagar, it says that they went to the land of Paran. Mm -hmm. And the land of Paran is none other, according to the biblical dictionaries, that is the land of Makkah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is a connection. And then we see the rest of it, which is filled in both by biblical verses and by the Quranic verses. I think there is a well where uh, Hagar prayed mm -hmm. and that water pond, you know, that's a well, yeah, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. That's the well of Zamzam. Yep. Yes, so, so the story goes like this, that Abraham, he let his wife Hagar and uh, her son uh, Ishmael, they were sent out to the outskirts of Makkah. So Makkah was not there the way that we see now. There was hardly any person living there. And they only had like a few, uh, few items of food. And obviously the food ran out and the water ran out and the baby was crying and uh, Hagar, the mother, she was running back and forth between the two hills. Just, you know, in a desperate uh, state to look for water and to seek some help. So it so happened that uh, God sent angel and the angel dug with his uh, wing and then came the water. And that water is called the water of Zamzam. It is continuous from that time to our time. You know, the well is much smaller than this room, maybe like one eighth of this room. But continuously to millions of people every single day, every single year, it is uh, quenching their thirst. And people take that water and they take it all over the world. Even then the world is not dry. It is in the middle of a desert. Just imagine, millions and billions of people have already extracted the water from it. It keeps on miraculously getting filled up. So that's also, we say, one of the miracles, and that's the history behind that well. So, thank you so much, brother. Sure, sure, welcome. For this conversation and hosting us, and we are really thankful. On behalf of North Park, we yes. really uh, are blessed to have a lovely neighbor. <laughs> of course. Us, and uh, uh, we hope we continue this relationship with you. And, uh, and also on my behalf, uh, Yes, and also I would really, really, really want to encourage all of you to come back and also our professor to bring other groups over here. Because just when we interact with each other, right, mm -hmm. eat pizza together maybe, right? <laughs> that also helps. No, and just... Biryani. Biryani. <laughs> biryani, right? You just offended you, you all. Know. <laughs> biryani is a special Indo-Pakistani rice with the meat, you know, yeah. with the spices, you know. Uh, so that's what your professor... With spices, be ready. <laughs> Have two or three bottles of water ready with you, <laughs> right? Uh, so again, uh, when we meet with each other, right, there are always like so many barriers, unfortunately, that we have, barriers of fears of the unknown. But when we meet with each other like this, we can see that so many barriers will go away. We can see the commonalities as we have as human beings. And so our, uh, our uh, you know, encouragement to us and all of you is that let's build those bridges and let's come to the common platform of those commonalities by worshiping the one true creator and by following God's guidance, yeah. not only we can establish good, wholesome societies, but by God's guidance, we hope and pray that he, uh, that he accepts us into the paradise, the highest place of paradise. Yeah. With that again, bottom of the heart, thank on behalf of the masjid to all of you. Thanks for coming, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Any, anyone wants to say anything? Last words? I just want to say thank you. I enjoyed um, the whole process it was uh, in-person learning. I, I okay. really received uh, uh, graciously from you all's uh, Good. Uh, presentation. And I'm so glad that of all of you, she's the only one writing notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is such so nice. The secretary of the group, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Yeah. The minute of the meeting, you know? She's pastor. <laughs> yeah, all right. If you guys want to take a group picture for memory, yes, it's yes, up to yes. you. I was about to say, yeah, yeah. we need a group picture. Uh, yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, oh God. So have a safe travel. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You have a long drive to go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I hope it was beneficial. Say it, huh? So, can next group is it? Every semester is it? Yeah, 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 every semester is it? Yeah,
the email or whatever you know yeah, professor yeah. paul mentioned contact the same way then we will all be here as a team to help you so is it okay to write you write you directly next time or wo sabhi ko mila ke likhna padega mila ke likh do acha rehta because sometimes i travel i just want to make sure that i don't miss any important emails sahi hai na no okay